Hello, Professor Laird here. And for this lecture, I just wanted to provide a general overview of the education system in the United States. This is from the perspective of our social problems class. There's lots of issues in our education system in the United States. But as far as America being very strong norm of education, we can see that as well. People looking at our gen general recent history here, people 25 years older, high school diploma, that increased from 41% in 1960 to 86% stabilized about at that since 2013. And those with college degrees is even more dramatic, 8%, we're talking about bachelor's degree here, 8% 1960 to about one third in today's time. 69, so this kind of correlates with the idea that about 69% of current jobs don't require a post high school degree. So that's probably because that's what's available. But uh, if the graduation of, of uh, bachelor's degrees increased, then there will probably be an increase in the amount of jobs that would subsequently require that. As with any situation in the United States where there may be some recessions or even in a, a pandemic type situation, public education is a, is a first target. Public education shed the most jobs of any sector in 2010 as a result of that great recession. This is a chart that comes out of our textbook. As you can see, the United States is um, slightly above the median in this comparison here as far as percentage of adults 25 to 64 with an associate's degree or higher. As I said, as far as bachelor's degree, we're at about a third of the country, a third of the population. That's a little bit further down on the list as far as comparisons go. Looking at our Sociological perspectives, more than likely, on the final test, I'll probably ask you again a question regarding one of these three sociological perspectives. We know the functionalist view, that's looking at society from the perspective of it being a living organism where all the parts of that organism contribute to the survival of that whole organism or to the maintenance of that organism are to the adaptability. We mentioned before that education is one of our primary agents of socialization. Next to our parents and our peers, education is, is pretty strong. We've got the, the manifest or the outwardly designed function of getting knowledge and making our society smarter, providing job training, helping us get that status that we strive for as human beings. There's lots of latent functions or hidden or indirect functions of education, transmitting norms of perhaps just work ethic and respect for social institutions, promoting social integration. We spend a lot of our time now we'll be, as we come out of the pandemic, we'll probably could be getting back into more social integration, group sharing, going back to school. That was probably something that our society was missing during the pandemic and may see some long-term results from that because of how important that is to humans. Other norms of learning responsibility, self-discipline, work habits, as I said, and to stimulate change with learning new things, openness to ideas and figuring out how to analyze stuff and to understand stuff, which is the reason why I'm here. So the education, very important part as far as agent of socialization goes, lots of functional aspects to it. This, um, this will probably uh, tie in a little bit to our conflict perspective as well. When you look at the differences between different groups of people as far as lifetime earnings goes, but the main thing I wanted to show here is that regardless of what group you're in, we'll, we'll talk about some of these disparities here in a little bit, 
But regardless of what group you're in, the more education you have, the higher your lifetime earnings. It's still a direct correlation, a direct positive correlation that the more education you have, the more money you will earn over your lifetime. Now that um, is kind of how the, the system has evolved over many years. But we know, obviously, that the smarter a society is, the more successful it's going to be in solving problems and progressing into uh, more positive avenues, things like that. From the conflict view, this is looking at society from the perspective of the, the tensions and the differences between competing groups of people. Again, another macro view looking at society at large. As far as the problems that we'll be discussing or the issues that are facing education system in America, yes, a lot of that will stem out of this conflict view. But as far as overall, generally, our system of education has been designed for the most part by the, uh, the elite decision makers, which is not surprisingly, but if the uh, elite decision makers aren't receptive to change or reform and it starts to outlive the, its usefulness as far as the way they are doing it, then that could be a problem by hanging on to that status quo because you have ensured yourself as a position of importance or, or uh, perhaps um, of um, power or whatever in this system and you're reluctant to change. There are arguments that if the school is concerned about other things as far as hurting students through just to uh, get them through the system, that could stifle creativity uh, as well as individualism. I, I will say, though, that as an educator who's been looking at this quite uh, rigorously for over 25 years now, I do know that the smarter you get, the more it does inspire creativity and new ideas. So I guess the, the challenge is this, are we, uh, are we learning or are we just kind of getting pushed through the system? The hidden curriculum is a term for just such as that where control discipline takes precedent over learning. At the younger grades, there may be situations where teachers feel like that they just have to make sure that the, the students are under control and, and perhaps paying attention or behaving, that sort of thing. Credentialism is another aspect of our system to where there's certainly some, you know, as far as how this has evolved, we want the smarter people to to go out there and and uh, make changes for the better, hopefully, that to solve our problems and, and make our decisions and run our systems and sort that sort of thing. But if more and more companies, organizations are increasing their levels of education just to get into their field in order to kind of stay above the competition, well, that um, could have some some negative aspects to it, whereas employers could be using, you know, obviously, if you have a pool of applicants, a lot of companies will say, obviously, the one with the most education might be the one that we would give a higher priority to. That's somewhat rational behavior. But if they're using degrees as a discriminating factor, then that's kind of what we're talking about here. I think what a lot of uh, corporations and companies have eventually done over time is just require a college degree. And so therefore that is going to kind of weed out perhaps some of their applicants right off the bat, good, bad, right or wrong. It's just how they are trying to um, focus in on their applicants. But in the, at the school level, pupils could actually be sorted according to class, according to test scores, according to expectations. This is a problem to where if a student starts off fairly early on is perhaps a problem student or a slow learner or has got some issues, then that label might get imposed upon that student. And then because of that label 
or because of the record that has been presented to subsequent teachers, then that student might be treated differently or perhaps even uh, held back because of the lower expectations, things like that. There's, um, you know, that's a challenge with uh, teaching the, uh, the younger children all the, well, all the way up through high school in particular, because we, uh, we certainly, as with the forum that I may post there, is what are some of the challenges as far as preparing students for higher education. Here shows another interesting disparity. This would be something that the feminist perspective of the conflict view there would be looking at the disparity in some of these fields. This is the one that I may have mentioned before that I was quite aware of when I was in college, the uh, paucity of uh, girls in my engineering classes and even to this day, very heavily weighted towards males in that particular field. There may be some inherent differences there as to what might attract males and females to certain types of uh, jobs. We touched on that earlier when we looked at the, the gender perspective. There are clearly some uh, genetic inher inherent differences between males and females due to this five and a half million years that we took to become human. So there could be some of that going on there. Um, I certainly, in, in my particular case, I certainly would have not considered discriminating against females as far as being in my classes or working for my engineering firms. Uh, so uh, I don't know that that. Now, there are certainly some professions that we've touched on before that are heavily male dominated that might have actually seen some discrimination towards women getting into those fields that uh, such as police and fire departments, which were uh, are still very heavily male dominated. Business approaching uh, parity there, social science is almost at even. And then as we uh, start to shift here, biological, biomedical, it starts to shift even more towards women, psychological, uh, psychology and health professions quite uh, predominantly towards females. I already told you that women are outperforming men in college degrees. So that'll be interesting to see how more of these start to shift. Another chart from the book, as far as the disparities between educational attainment in race. Now, as far as high school diplomas, you can see some of the differences here, some fairly significant, but when you look at bachelor's degree or higher, even more differences there, looking between white uh, attainments of a college degree versus black, Hispanic, that sort of thing some still pretty significant differences in those levels. Another thing I like to touch on is the increasing cost of college. That's um, one of the issues that is um, worth talking about in this particular section on social problems, that tuition costs have increased dramatically over the years. And similar to healthcare costs, they keep increasing because they can. Because as costs for college go up, the demand for a college degree is still there. Companies still require college degrees. We still know how important a college degree is to your lifetime earnings and as well as the, uh, the general uh, increasing intelligence of a society in general, right, that will uh, help it solve more problems or perhaps coexist more favorably. Community college, which is a good option to take to hold back some of those costs and then go from there to a, another or to a four year school. Uh, so, but uh, the costs have risen dramatically, particularly since the, the 1980s. As I said, one of the reasons is that as costs go up, the demand is still there. So colleges can think of other ways in which to raise costs as well. Like I said, the value of that college degree is still very strong and that employers have increasingly required degrees. We've actually shifted a little bit more to a knowledge economy as opposed to a, um, a um, manufacturing industrial economy. So colleges have been able to increase these costs while at the same time maintaining that demand, like I said, similar to the healthcare costs. 
And the increasing costs have actually been facilitated by the rising student loan industry, which even when I was in college, there was very little need. If you had a decent summer job, even you uh, might not even necessarily need to get a loan. But now as costs go up, loans are predominant. And so they kind of feed off of each other. If if a student needs a loan to get the, to the uh, college degree, well, then the cost could come up because that that cost is kind of hidden somewhat by that loan that, that will be paid off later on down the road. So that that's uh, yeah, kind of similar to the ins insurance industry and the healthcare system where those costs are kind of deferred later on, but have to be paid for over time. And the uh, one of the biggest culprits here is the for-profit colleges. The, the jury is still out on for-profit colleges as far as their effectiveness and how much, how credible they are going to be. Because if a college just says, well, pay me money and I'll give you a degree, that kind of works against the idea of colleges being non-profit so that we base it on the ability to learn, not the ability to pay. And the, the biggest source of defaults for college student loans is from for-profit colleges when uh, it might obviously have something to do with uh, the people that are pursuing for-profit colleges and then realizing that it may be too expensive or not pay off, things like that. Looking at the interactionist view of education, that's the one where we're looking at the micro level. This is looking at the individual daily, taken for granted behaviors of individuals as far as the symbolic nature of what you know drives us on a day-to-day -day basis. Labeling children, as I said, this is at the, the micro level, the, the interaction between a student and a teacher. Labeling the children could impact their performance Lowering those expectations could then result in, in lowered performance or how teachers deal with individual students or even uh, groups of students at the classroom level, how the school serves to build relationships between fellow students in order to uh, find friends, find uh, mates, that sort of thing. So let's talk about a couple of major issues in U.S. education. And that is, of course, the increased spending on it. Not only do we pay more for our college, for example, United States in general has a higher per pupil spending ratio. And we'll talk about this a little bit more, but school financing, or we'll talk about private schools in a little bit, but public school financing is primarily through property taxes at the local level. It's one of the highest expenditures at the local level. State level, highest expenditures are typically the uh, uh, health care as well as education. And then at the local level, education, law enforcement, things like that are the highest expenditures for local governments. The, despite the fact that comparatively speaking with other democracies around the world, we spend more, but our outcomes are less. And this seems to be a general trend th throughout the class that we've noticed is, is how the United States can be the most successful, quote unquote, democracy as far as economic powerhouse in democracy and general stability. But yet we, we tend to rank further down the list in so many indicators, and this is just yet another example, is how we are pretty further down on the list. And students tend to rank poorly at the higher they go up into the grade level, particularly we're talking here K through 12. We'll look at that here in a minute and uh, perhaps provide some theories as to why that is. Education, as I said, is biggest expense of most state and local budgets. The standardized testing mandates, there are pros and cons to this as far as teaching to the test, which could be counterproductive to learning. But as a math tutor, I do see the value 
in having a test that looks at all the students all across the country that are taking that same test. That way we can start to gauge their, in my case, their math level skills. And these, these tests have a very strong correlation to, a, to the strength of a particular student's math skills. There is a very strong correlation there that those tests are able to, to show. But there's lots of other standardized tests out there. And if schools and, and the schools have been accused of teaching to the test, so to speak, so that particularly if they're getting funding based on the performance of their students on these standardized tests, which is not what the ACT or the SAT typically does as far as getting into college, but um, that that could be problematic or counterproductive. The, uh, the SAT and ACT scores have been tilting downward, so that perhaps is indicative of several other things out there in our society, less priority being played uh, or placed on education, particularly social media over the past 20 plus years has provided increasingly more distractions towards uh, learning and uh, school performance. Here's the trend, as you can see, going back to the 70s, looking at uh, reading and math scores, and then the progressively downward trend year after year after year, for the most part, there was a uh, somewhat of a, looks like a, a slight spike here in the late 90s, but then kind of uh, a uh, somewhat of a leveling out to a certain degree. And then as far as critical reading goes, a generally downward trend. And then one of the things that could be problematic with the education system is that if we dumb the system down itself in order to try to improve the scores, and there has been some, uh, I guess, investigations into this where standardized tests actually change their, their format in order to see a spike an increase in the scores. As you can see right here, they changed their format from this year to the next, and you can see a significant spike in the scores. And that's not because that in all of a sudden, just one year, the student population in general got literally 20 points higher in their, their level of performance. No, what that happens is they just changed the grading criteria to make the scores look higher. And that, you know, that could be uh, kind of defeating the purpose of, of attacking the problem. That might be just kind of glossing over the problem in a way. Looking at the, uh, the National Association of Educational Progress here, they do regular assessments. And particularly since the early 90s, there was a downward trend. Again, they changed their assessments as well it, to kind of pick the scores back up a little bit. But the the main thing to show here is that amongst 9 and 13 years olds, the general trend continued up, whereas with 17 years olds, the trend, you know, they, they've got this scale quite small, so it's kind of hard to see the, uh, the trends, but generally we can see, and I think the idea here is that the older a student gets into high school, more than likely, the less monitoring they're going to have by their parents. The more freedoms they're going to have to do other stuff, the more distractions that they're going to have, such as social media and stuff like that, whereas parents are less involved in their child's life, the older they get. Now, I'm not saying across, you know, all the way across the board, but in general, that seems to be a, a common trend whereas nine and 13 years olds here are gonna be a little bit more, perhaps significantly more closely monitored by their parents as far as what they're into with respect to social media and their and friends and peers and things like that, is, and uh, a little bit more closely keeping tabs on their schoolwork. So that, that probably has something to do with as well. Cross-country comparison, this was done by the OECD, which is the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, which is 
got 35 members of the developed democracies around the world, and they do studies like this all the time, comparing all the developed countries of the world. And the United States is pretty far down on the list as far as cross-country comparisons. Overall, on the reading scale, we are higher than the average, but we are still per pretty farther down on the list compared to these countries here in this list. Looking at the mathematics scale, we, the United States, are actually significantly below the world average. And then on the science scale, we are right at the world average. So that that seems a little strange considering we are the most economically successful country in the entire world with the longest and most stable democracy out there in the world. But yet indicators here show that we are once again pretty far down on the list. As far as some other interesting things to look at as far as student standards, this is the one that I kind of alluded to. Are the standards just being lowered or de-emphasized in order to, to get a better outcome? Are we actually seeing less emphasis placed on critical thinking, analytical analysis? As you may have noticed, that's something that I, regardless of what class I teach, I put a lot of emphasis on how can we objectively analyze this issue? What is critical thinking and how is that done? The scientific method, remember I talked about that, going using a scientific process to try to figure stuff out. And we are very ignorant overall, in general, as you know, I'm looking at just general statistics here. When it comes to history and government, we are pretty well uninformed on that, as well as foreign relations. Those are things that are not as interesting to us as a general population but yet they are extremely important. History helps us know who we are, how we got to where we are. Government, this is the process of where our problems are addressed and decisions are made. So it's very important to understand how government works and why it works the way it does or why it doesn't work. <laughs> That's just as important. We have to understand why that is. And again, softening the curriculum with non-academic type subjects that in order to try to improve the outcomes. That's just another thing that we've got to look at. Teachers usually take the brunt of the criticism. They're at the front line teaching the students. And yes, there is a clear difference between teachers. There, there are some teachers that are certainly not as qualified or as competent as other teachers. And that's something that schools have to figure out how to assess because if it is a poor quality of teaching, that has an effect on student enthusiasm in, as well as increasing student indifference. Now, another thing that we've got to deal with in America, which could be part of the equation here, is that teachers in general have lower pay than many other occupations out there in the United States, and it may be a a factor of being less of a prestigious type of job in our U.S. culture, along with police officers, which is a very dangerous job, but has a very low pay, comparatively speaking. Teachers are also kind of out there on the front lines trying to teach the kids, but they are very low paid in comparison to other, particularly private sector jobs. Unions kind of have a... Um, pro and con element here where unions do provide opportunities for students to collectively bargain and get higher pay and get more benefits from their teaching jobs. But unions could also potentially protect those that may not need to be teaching that should be in other jobs or that are just flat out incompetent at this teaching job. And therefore, the unions could be protecting them somewhat in, the, in those jobs and then spending a lot of time, like I said, on disciplining students. This certainly would vary from school to school or even just motivating students to pay attention and learn. Those are some things that teachers have to deal with that could literally distract them from the teaching aspect of it. There is a pretty large disparity 
between states, since this is a pretty much a state delegated function, the, the federal government does not necessarily have anything in its constitution that says that it's or in the Bill of Rights that says you're guaranteed an education. That's pretty much just delegated down to the states to take care of that. There are, as I said, some federal consistencies that we want to get everybody on the same page. But certainly as far as the quality of the schools and the pay, quite a big disparity here. The the states that are the lowest paid actually a couple of years ago were the ones that struck West Virginia teachers went on strike because they were the lowest paid teachers in the United States. They did get some benefits. A few months later, the state of Oklahoma teachers went on strike. They were the second lowest paid in the United States and they saw some benefits as a result of that. So those are uh, just some comparisons. This is another chart that is kind of for fun, and I've, I've only been able to validate a few of these, but most of this makes sense that the, uh, and you can find this on the internet in a thousand different places, but the highest paid public official in each state are typically college football coaches. And uh, we have some interesting exceptions here, college president, medical school dean, uh, medical school plastic surgeon. But it, as you can see throughout, there is a predominance of football coaches and basketball coaches being the highest paid public employee in that entire state. Higher, certainly higher paid than the governor. The bureaucracy of an educational system has a tendency to grow because it's providing a support function, which is clearly helpful. But if you start to add on administrative elements because you can, and that's probably one of, been, uh, one of the bigger drivers of the increasing costs of college, is that the administrative arm of it, the bureaucratic arm of it, has been getting more and more. The ratio could be as high as one employee per eight teachers, which uh, may not sound like a... Uh, a high ratio, but um, it's been increasing, and you'd have to look. It says, "Well, how many, how many bureaucratic functions do we need to support the teachers?" Right, and particularly when the primary goal is to just teach the kids. Public schools do have the opportunity to act like little monopolies in their region because of school districts, and those school districts are funded by the property taxes that are collected in that district. So they do have somewhat of a monopolistic aspect there that could prevent them from reform or change. And that's why there's a, a growing number of options out there. They could have, as the bureaucracy grows, that could result in less accountability, yet more rules at the same time. And of course, the studies show that the increasing bureaucratic arms of a school do not really add to the school's effectiveness because the bottom line is what are the students being taught, how are, are they being taught, and how are they retaining that knowledge. And the bureaucratic arm is really not adding to that effectiveness. There's a lot of issues with school equity, as I said, property tax is the primary funding. And if you live in a poor neighborhood, guess what? You're not going to be able to collect as much property taxes. However, kind of like this bureaucratic relationship, it's very difficult to find a significant relationship between the amount of money that you spend and the performance that you get from the students, because it's just simply a matter of teaching that material to students and have figuring out how they are going to retain that information. So there's lots of other ingredients in this societal stew that we live in that adds to that. And, and a lot of it could go right back to the parents' involvement, the parents' influence on the kids as far as wanting to learn and uh, providing an atmosphere of learning, whether they're in school or at home. That's, those are some things. 
the uh, like and that's what i'm saying here the family socioeconomic background is a pretty strong influence on performance because if a child is raised by parents who are generally higher educated right because uh, not only are they going to be more influential on that student getting higher education as well they are generally going to have more money and that's uh, unfortunately another strong predictor is that the higher income you have, the more chances you are going to have of going to college, for example. And that's just kind of how it keeps feeding on itself, because if you have a college degree, you're going to have a higher income, right? And then therefore, your children are going to have more resources as well as perhaps a stronger influence on going to college as well. Minority students, there's lots of things going on here that could be contributing to that. And just like with a, a lot of other issues that we've talked about, the lower socioeconomic strata has lots of things that are kind of influencing it that, that keep these, um, these uh, indicators at these lower levels. And then, of course, if there's negative peer pressure against learning or you know, being the nerd uh, by wanting to uh, excel at the class, those are some other things that we would examine. Private schools have actually kind of uh, ticked downward a little bit since 1999. There's uh, in the United States 5.8 million students in private schools as compared to 47 million in public schools. The average private school has 166 students, considerably smaller than the average public school at 526. The average private school student teacher ratio is 12 to 1. And interestingly enough, that's really not significantly smaller than a public school's ratio of 16 to 1. But uh, there is a lot of sentiment that if our students are not improving or if we're on a downward trend, then it must be the public school's fault. So therefore, we need to send our kids to private school. And private school students, on average, do tend to perform, you know, measurably better. You know, how much better is uh, kind of uh, ranges from place to place. It is measurably better. But what is also comes out of that is that when families send their children to private schools, it's primarily because they are more directly involved in their students' performance. So therefore, that could be more of a factor of family attributes rather than the quality of education is any better than it is at public schools. And so therefore, you know, since I, for example, when I teach math, I know that there's only one answer to two plus two. Two plus two only has one answer. So whether you teach that at a private school or a public school or a poor school or a rich school or a school that's predominantly minority school or a school that's predominantly rich kids, it's the same answer. And so therefore, and that goes with many other subjects, whether it's history or um, science, it's still the same material regardless of which school you're teaching it at. So therefore, family attributes could be or the environment that a student is is raised in that uh, promotes values of education and learning. The issue of vou vouchers here is, is one where some states are allowing parents to get a, a subsidy, a voucher of money that they can then use that money to go to a private school. Now, some of the issues there is that the majority of private schools are religiously affiliated. So therefore, if a parent takes their kid to a private school that is run by a religious institution, then there may be some religious doctrine required to be taught in that school as well. And therefore, you're starting to blur the lines of separation of church and state, where you've got public money being used to be spent on religiously oriented private schools. So that is a, 
an issue that as the courts lean a little bit more conservative, they're a little bit more lenient on that, but there still is a, uh, a divide there. As far as homeschooling goes, it's smaller still. There's various reasons why parents would want to send their or keep their kids at home. It's 3% of K-12 through students. And this is less for religious reasons. It is more for the parents' concern for the quality of education. So again, there's some, some of that perception again with the public system, or that if there is a uh, perception of lack of discipline or violence in a particular school, then they might, might want to keep their kids at home. And you know, that, that certainly varies from place to place as well as you know parent to parent. But the, the critics of homeschool claim that students lose social interaction. There, there probably is some element of that because of how much kids can uh, socialize while at school. But as we tend to see more and more kids becoming so involved on social media, then they can do that at home as much as, as they could at, uh, at school anyway. The supporters tend to claim positive results, but similar to, to private schools, the, the primary indicator as to why homeschoolers would have a slightly higher performance outcome is because it's most likely due to the fact that their parents are more involved, in fact, directly involved in their education, and the kids are getting more individual attention from their parents. So that's probably the strongest factor that results in those differences. Charter schools is another option because the the concept of choice has, has grown in the United States as to where if parents want to find an alternative to the public school system, this is another one where an organization, a sponsoring agency, even a corporation or a group of private individuals who want to uh, finance this, what they will do is literally set up a charter for a new school that they are financing. It will have its independent criteria as far as curricula goes, but they're in order to get sanctioned or excuse me, uh, I guess you could say registered as a an official school, as a charter school, there are some prevailing standards that it would have to comply with. And fairly small number still on charter schools, 3.1 million children, but most of the states have tried charter schools. And again, much like uh, as we would expect here, there's mixed results. Some charter schools show higher outcomes than their, the neighboring public schools, and in some cases, vice versa. The, it, again, it's um, the, the material that they're teaching is, is the same, whether it's a public school, private school, charter school, home school even then. The, so the, the results are still mixed on that. So that uh, concludes what I wanted to talk about as far as the uh, education system in general. So I just wanted to post this lecture online as a supplement to the course for this particular lecture topic.